Good morning. Welcome to the Vine Community Church. We're pleased you have joined with us this morning, whether or not you regularly worship with us. If you want to know more about our church and what we're doing during the COVID-19 pandemic, you can find information on our website. That's vineccl.org.uk. Last Wednesday, our youngest daughter brought a birthday present for Angela. When she arrived, she noticed there was something wrong with her exhaust. It was hanging down and looked as though it was only supported on one side. It was unbalanced, but seemed secure. She asked us if it was safe to drive home like that. We said we didn't know. So, drive slowly and try to avoid the bumps, I said. Almost impossible in our country lanes in Norfolk, actually. I read James 2 verses 14 to 17 that morning. This is what it says. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. My Bible reading note said, To James, proclamations of faith are empty and false if they do not bear fruit in actions. We are, not, we are to be not merely hearers, but doers of the word. We may enjoy rousing sermons, be lifted to ecstasy by worship songs, or be caught up in heaven when receiving communion. Yet, if none of these impact on what we do after our act of worship is over, we are like someone who has had a mirror held up so they can see their true features, but then immediately forgets what they look like. So we can be unbalanced Christians, not balancing faith and works. An example which I thought of might be, do we learn of places coping with war or famine or coronavirus in the news, or all three at once, as Yemen is at the moment, and do nothing about it? Are there actions that God prompts us to take? If so, we need to take them and to rebalance our Christianity. So, did my daughter Beth arrive home safely? No. Ten minutes later, she phoned to say the back box of the exhaust had fallen off three miles down the road. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Let us pause in the presence of our Lord. Sit quietly and let your breathing slow down as you find a stillness ready for our prayers. If thoughts intrude as you concentrate on God, acknowledge them, but return to your quietness and stillness until you are ready for prayer. Psalm 103, 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Lord in heaven, from our still place we do praise you. You are the creator God, and each time we notice the scent of a rose, the song of a bird, the sunrise or sunset, or any other beauty that you have given us, we are in awe. You are the Holy One, the Lord of all, and we uplift you in our worship and adoration. Yet it's not just the beauty of this world that makes us turn to you, Lord. In your great love, you have been compassionate towards us, we who are sinners. You have redeemed us through sending your Son, Jesus, 
to die for us, to take our sins on himself. Our hearts are overwhelmed by this great sacrifice. We love you, Lord, and lift our hearts to you. Psalm 46, 1. God is our shelter and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Lord, we bring our needs to you, not just our own, but those of the needy world. Please have mercy on our land and other lands, and forgive those who turn against you. We pray that you will continue to deliver our country from the ravages of the coronavirus. We pray for our government and those who lead us in any way that they will have wisdom at this time as we emerge from lockdown. And we pray that our leadership team, Nigel and Dan, Ken and myself, will know your will for our church. We pray for those countries where war, famine and disease are causing such distress and so many deaths. Help each of us to know how to play our part in helping them with a generous spirit. And we pray for our neighbours and those around us. Each of us can bring to mind those who need practical help and those who need you. Please help us to act on the nudges from you to be an ambassador for Christ as we step forward to help. Psalm 51.10 Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, nothing we have prayed for today will be of any value unless we come to you in purity, having confessed our sins to you and forgiven those who have caused us distress. Help us to have such an overwhelming understanding of your forgiveness towards us that we find it easy to forgive others. Then may our lives and actions glorify you, O Lord. In the name of Jesus, hear our prayers today. Amen. Now, let's worship our God of Wonders with Anne.
what's next. It's children's church, of course. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to children's church number ten. ten. Can you believe it? Ten times uh, that we've had children's church online like this. So I know that last week you all had a Zoom meeting with your new teacher, didn't you? And I also know that some of you have found out that when you go back to school in September, your classes are going to be mixed up a little bit. And there's going to be different children uh, in your class to what there were before lockdown. And I'm wondering how you're all feeling about that. If you're excited, that's wonderful, that's marvellous. But I know some of you might be feeling some other things. Some of you might be feeling a little bit nervous. You might be worried. Some of you might even be feeling a little bit angry. And all of those things are okay because God gave us all those different emotions, didn't he? But however you are feeling, I think that when you do go back in September, you are definitely going to need some... Courage. Courage. Thank you, Melissa. And Annabelle, I wonder if you could find out for us what that word means. Hey Google, what does the word courage mean? This is the definition of courage. The ability to do something that frightens one. Bravery. Ah, oh, the ability to do something that frightens you. That's to be brave. Because some of you I know, uh, it's going to be your first time ever in big school, isn't it? You would have just left preschool. Some of you have not even been at school at all uh, for nearly six months, so for nearly half a year. And for those of you that have been, you're definitely going to have a new teacher and there may well be different children in your class. Are you going to need to be brave? I think so. And the good news for us as Christians is that if we need help with absolutely anything in life, we can go to the Bible. So in today's Bible story, uh, we're going to meet a man who definitely showed great courage. So last week, the Israelites made the choice not to enter the promised land of Canaan. Do you remember? We were thinking about choices, weren't we? And a consequence of that choice was that they had to wander in the wilderness for another 40 years. God was still faithful and provided for them. They continued to have manna to eat and water to drink. And Moses was still their leader. But still, they continued to wander. In today's session, Moses has reached the ripe old age of 120 years old, and it's time for him to hand over to a new leader. But before we do that, I really think we should stop and just uh, think for a minute about what an amazing man Moses was. So we have learned over the past eight weeks, haven't we, that God saved Moses for, from an almost certain death, as you remember, his mum put him in a basket in the river. We found out that he was brought up as a prince uh, in, an, in an Egyptian palace. And I'm wondering, was that God's leadership training? Was that God preparing Moses for what he had planned for him in the future? Because then, of course, Moses has led the Israelites for 40 years, hasn't he? And he's done all this despite the fact that he didn't feel he was up to the job. Do you remember the conversation Moses had with God at the burning bush? And Moses was saying, please... Send somebody else, Lord, not me. I, I can't do this. God had different ideas, though. Uh, let's read this verse from Deuteronomy, chapter 34. I think it's verses 10 to 12. Yes, it is. And it kind of sums up uh, what kind of a man Moses was. So here goes. There has never been another prophet like Moses. The Lord knew Moses face to face. The Lord sent Moses to do signs and miracles in Egypt. He did them to the king to all his officers and to the whole land of Egypt. Moses had great power. He did wonderful things for all the Israelites to see. Wow, so there's never been a prophet like Moses. The Lord knew him face to face. He did great signs and miracles. And all this with the feeling he felt like he wasn't up to the job. He definitely had to show courage, didn't he? And although Moses never got to lead uh, the Israelites into the promised land, uh, God did take him up a mountain and give him a glimpse of it before he died. God led Moses up a mountain and showed him the land that he had promised to the Israelites. So do you remember these guys from last week? We have Joshua and we have Caleb. Uh, they were the two that had faith when they went to spy out the promised land, weren't they? Uh, and it's one of these that God chooses to be the new leader for his people, the Israelites. But who will it be? Will it be Joshua or will it be Caleb? 
Can you pat your knees and give me a drum roll, please, at home? Are you ready? Drum roll, please. It is the new leader's going to be Joshua. So Joshua is the new leader of the Israelites. And Joshua actually gets a whole um, book of the Bible written after him, the book of Joshua. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So in the first chapter of Joshua, God uh, tells Joshua to get the Israelites ready to cross the River Jordan into the promised land. Woohoo! Finally, it is time. God is going to lead them into the promised land. How exciting is that? Now, God also tells Joshua um, uh, in this first chapter that he is going to be with him in the same way that he was with Moses. Now, that must have been so comforting for Joshua to hear because Joshua had actually been Moses' assistant for quite a long time. So he would have seen firsthand how God was with Moses. And God is saying to Joshua, I'm going to be with you in the same way that I was with Moses. And guess what else God tells Joshua? Not one, not two, not three, but four times. I can't turn my hand the right way. Four times in that first chapter, God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Because God knows that Joshua is going to need to have courage. What is it we said courage means? It means to uh, do something that frightens you, to be brave, because God knows we're human. God knows. Do you remember the, the giants? Do you remember the walls? God knows that Joshua is going to need courage. He says, I'm going to be with you. Be strong and courageous. Not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. Have courage, Joshua. And the other thing God says uh, twice is do not be afraid. Afraid. Isn't it comforting to know that God understands the way we feel? But moving on, because today is the day God tells Joshua to get the people ready because today is the day that they are going to cross the River Jordan and begin to move towards the promised land. Uh, but the river's really deep, isn't it? There's no way that we can cross, is there? Not without a boat or something. Hang on a minute, Joshua thinks. We've been here before, haven't we? You know, the Red Sea. And God's promised me that he's going to be with me in the same way that he was with Moses. God's not going to let us down. So what Joshua does is he sends the priests on ahead. He sends the priests ahead of the people, carrying the special box that has got God's laws in it. You remember those tablets with the commandments on? And he sends the priests to the edge of the river. And they reach the edge of the river. And what happens? Nothing, I'm afraid. So what Joshua does is he says, hang on, we need to have faith, we need to have faith. So what he does is he tells the priests to get their feet wet. He tells them to actually step into the edge of the river. And they do. They step into the edge of the river. And as soon as their feet are in the river, the water stops flowing. It piles up on one side, almost like there's a dam there. And yet again, uh, the Israelites are able to cross this river on dry ground in the same way that they crossed the Red Sea. Amazing. Yet again, God has displayed his power and shown how he is with these people and how he is going to keep his promise of this land uh, to these people. So once they're across the river, what Joshua does is he chooses 12 uh, men, one from each of the tribes of Israel, and he sends them out and he says, go and find a rock uh, from the river, the, the biggest one you can find, go and find a big rock and bring it back here. And what we're going to do is we're going to pile up these rocks. We're going to leave these 12 rocks there. And when your children ask what these rocks are for, you are to tell them that they're there as a reminder of how um, I uh, brought you through um, into this promised land. And then they set up camp. Uh, they camp outside this big city called Jericho. And we're going to carry on with this story next week. So goodbye to Moses and hello to Joshua. And what great courage uh, Joshua had to show in today's story, didn't he? Uh, he instructed the priests to step in the water. And as soon as they did, uh, God showed that he really was truly with Joshua and with his people, the Israelites. And uh, in Joshua 1.5, uh, it also says that God is with us. I will never leave you. I will never forget you. Uh, says God. And also Joshua 1.9, it's that verse that uh, I've repeatedly talked about, isn't it? 
uh, in Joshua 1, 9, God uh, says, be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. So when we face situations in life that might frighten us, uh, we should remember that God promises to always be with us. I will never leave you or forget you, God says. And when we really know that, that can help us to, to move forward, to almost take that step into the river with courage. Thank you, Julie. So the adventure continues with Joshua. Now, you remember we said we would revisit songs to learn them. Let's remember that there is hope. There is hope in the mighty name. Anne is going to read for us now. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptised, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. Now, before Nigel gives us a short message, let's sing a lovely song from Resound Worship about our Saviour's love. Remember, you can play it again to learn it. We think you'll want to.
Good morning. Well, it's great to hear that almost all of you have managed to gather in your garden churches this week and have fellowship together, despite the inclement weather. And how good it was to meet together for the first time since lockdown, albeit in small groups. There is something wonderful about the way this ties in with our study of the church as it began about 2000 years ago. But today I wanted to backtrack a little to look at the actual inauguration of the church. Anne read Acts 20, uh, sorry, 2, 36 to 41 for us. And before this, Jesus had breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And we read that in John 20, 22. But he told them to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And that happened at Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out on all of the believers and the church was born. And God's power was given to the disciples to spread the gospel. The confusion of languages at the Tower of Babel was reversed as God united people of all languages and they heard the gospel in their own tongue as the disciples spoke in tongues. How exciting was that? Well, the commotion must have been great as they were full of joy, praising God and spilled out into the streets and loads of people came from all over the place to hear what this was all about and they were pretty perplexed about it all. And some of them even thought that the disciples may be a bit drunk. And Peter stood up where they could all see him and he preached to them and reminded them about Jesus of Nazareth and how wonderful he was and how many miracles he performed and the signs and the uh, miracles and the healings um, and all those wonders and, they, and proved that he was the Messiah and that they had crucified him. And it says that they were cut to heart when they heard this. Their hearts were pierced through. And that's where I want to start. Because the church didn't start by a whole load of people deciding to join a club. And neither was it uh, a whole load of people around some fantastic market deal at a cut down price. This was something far greater than anyone had seen before. Peter preached with tremendous power and the Holy Spirit moved through the crowd crowd convicting them of sin. Now there's a difference there between condemning and convicting. He wasn't condemning them, he was convicting them so that they uh, would have the right reaction. So the word of God couldn't be ignored because it came across in such power. And I want to talk about three things. Uh, the first is two actions. The second is two gifts. And the third is four results. So what are the two actions? Well, the crowd said, what shall we do after Peter had preached? And he said to them that they had to repent. And that was to turn away from their own ways, to turn from their sins, to agree that God's verdict was right, that they were wrong, and that they needed God in their lives. So they were to repent. They weren't expected to become perfect. That's not what repentance means. They weren't expected to suddenly clean themselves up because they couldn't do that. But they had to turn to God. Second, they had to be baptised, which was well understood by every single one of them, what that meant. There was no question about it. Baptism showed that you had both feet in one camp, and that was the Lord's. And it was part and parcel. Peter said, repent and be baptised. So that was followed by two gifts from God. The first was that they would be fully forgiven for all their sins. And second is that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, a double whammy, 
absolutely amazing. And I just want to read two passages from the Bible. The first is from Psalm 32, and it says this, How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is the person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity and whose, in whose spirit is no deceit. That last bit means that they're not hiding their sin. They're not pretending that they didn't. Uh, so there's no deceit in there. They're walking in the light. How joyful is a person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity and in whose spirit is no deceit. Then if we go, so that's forgiveness. So we go now to John 7, verse 37. It says this, On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Superb verses. One about forgiveness and the other one about receiving the Holy Spirit. So now we come to the four results that issue from this. And by results, I mean fruit or the actions of these new disciples. If you remember, Ken reminded us at the beginning of this service that James said that if you say you believe something, but it doesn't have any effect on the way you live, it doesn't, it doesn't actually prove anything and it doesn't show that your faith is real. And Julie spoke about the priests putting their feet in the water of the River Jordan, an act of faith, and it dried up for them. Well, look what happened to these new disciples. This is what we looked at and, and read to us. And it was what we looked at when we studied Becky Rogers' book this week. This is the family of God in action. Acts 2 verse 42, it says this, they devoted themselves to four things, to the apostles teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Teaching, fellowship, the communion and prayer. And I have to say that this was my experience when I first became a Christian. I couldn't get enough of the Bible, even though when I tried to read the Bible before becoming a Christian, it seemed anemic to me. But Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2 verse 2, like newborn infants, desire the milk of the word so that you may grow up into your salvation. Secondly, I love spending time fellowshipping with other Christians. I couldn't get enough of being with them. The writer to the Hebrew says in 10, 24 to 25, and let us watch one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. So we're encouraged to do that and that's exactly how I felt. I loved being with other Christians. I loved celebrating the church communion with other Christians as well. And we had that every Sunday morning. We celebrated the breaking of the bread after a time of open sharing and singing and worship. In fact, some years later, my father-in-law came to that service and uh, to the morning service at our church. And he was utterly blown away by how all the things people shared with each other tied in and he had never seen anything like it. And it was all spontaneous. It wasn't pre-planned. It wasn't organised uh, in that way. It was just the Holy Spirit moving amongst the different people, inspiring each person to say and share something. And I remember him being very impressed by that. And then I loved attending prayer meetings. That church believed in prayer. 
and the power of prayer. And we prayed a lot. And sometimes we would pray for three hours on a Saturday afternoon. And in fact, my conversion was the result of a three hour prayer meeting, not just for me, but others as well. And I soon became a Christian after all of that prayer. So isn't that wonderful? There's four things that we want to make sure that we ha have in our lives. A thirst for God's word, a love to be with other Christians, a, an, a real celebration and um, a valuing of the breaking of bread, and also not having to be pushed into prayer, but because we want to pray, because we are Christians, we want to see God work. And I think that's really important that we, we do that. So as we move through into this study, this week we're going to be looking at the church unleashed as a servant. We want to make sure that we move from this sound foundation of this conversion that is built on repentance, receiving the spirit, and then moving on to learn more about God's word, fellowshipping with each other, celebrating the communion, and remembering all that Jesus did for us, and praying. And I believe that that will be the gospel that we tell other people as well. There isn't any compromise in it. Uh, there's no half-heartedness. It's an all or nothing gospel. And we need to make sure that that's what we're preaching. And uh, we may be able to pray with people who have problems, but at the same time, we mustn't uh, downgrade those demands and those that uh, uncompromising gospel. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. Where any of us have strayed, lost our way, forgotten that we were cleansed from our past sins, Lord, forgive us. May we, with renewed hope and spirit-driven determination, follow you without question and trust you without query, so that we may accomplish all that you have planned for us and for the kingdom in your strength. Amen. Since you first looked in my